This is the Hillcrest Podcast, and we are thankful you are listening today. First of all, if you're a regular listener, we hope that each week you leave feeling encouraged, inspired, and motivated to experience Jesus throughout your week. If you regularly attend Hillcrest and want more resources, you can visit our website at hillcrestchurch.info. Thank you for listening today. Good morning, everybody. It's great to have you here today. Thank you for being here. My name is Brian Compton. I know a lot of you thought that I was Dwayne Johnson earlier, and that's very kind of you. It's just a costume. Don't let it fool you. Uh, I did go get a cold, so that's why my voice is kind of doing this thing, which sounds a little bit like him. But anyway, it's great to have you here. I'm so happy you're here with us today. Um, I felt like last week when I encouraged costumes, I was like, it's either going to be like the best thing or the worst thing. And it's the best thing in my opinion. I'm so proud of you guys. You look awesome. All of you who did. If you didn't, that's okay. Not everyone's into it, but I'm glad that you guys did today. Um, so I have a part two of a message I started last week for you that I want to pick up with. So here's a verse for you. If you have your Bible, you can open it up to Exodus 17. I need to give you a couple like premise points that you need to know going into the back half of this message here, because this applies to you in your spiritual life where you're at. So we see it happening in the book of Exodus, to Moses, and then to the nation of Israel, but it also happens to you, and so I want you to know this. So in Exodus 17, it says, From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. The point, the principle, is that God moves us incrementally through stages in life. And so no stages, no progress. Without them, we go through times of stagnation. And so we need stages. I mean, because I, I, I advocate it'd be great to be born in your prime, live fully in your prime, and then die in your prime. But without that, there's no progress. There's no, there's no tenacity. There's, there's a lack of character. And no stages means no fullness. And we see the fullness uh, of completion come through like in the seasons of a year. And so Israel, at this point that we're looking at, they are free from slavery in Egypt, and they are learning what it is like to be a nation whose identity is found in their God, not their oppressors. You have to understand that for 400 years, they have been enslaved, and so they saw themselves as people who were owned by someone else, not by God. And I think this is a huge, huge principle for us, because I think a lot of times we as human beings put our identities in superficial things and not in things of substance. We put our identities in things we can see, in things that will end on this planet, in things that essentially we are confused about, and we don't fully understand who we are in Christ. And so God removes them from their slavery and puts them in a desert for a period of time so that they can learn who they are in God. And so they'll spend this next generation in the desert, which represents a place of dependence on God. And so it's interesting because as they move through the stages, each stage builds upon the last stage. So it's not necessarily about you need to spend X amount of time here and X amount of time here. It's that you need to know who God is. And when you know this about God, then you can move on to the next stage of this is also what God is like. And this is how God operates. And when you hit a situation like this, this is what God will do. You have to look at the tea kettle that just walked in. All right, like, I'm sorry, I'm distracted because I told you this is the best thing we've ever done. Thank you. All right. Strong point, strong entrance. We're good. So before they can enter the promised land, there's some critical stages that they need to experience first. And it's really that they, there's some critical lessons they need to learn about God, about who God is and then who they are in light of God before they move on. Just like Moses did. If you've been here for this whole series, you recognize a pattern now. You realize that Moses has gone through a very similar journey. Here's what's interesting about Moses' journey. He did this whole thing, learned who he was in light of God, and then now he's leading other people to find themselves in God. And this is huge for us, because oftentimes we just make it about ourselves. What can God do for me? And the whole time God's like, I want you to help other people. And you're like, no, 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 it's, it's got to be about me make it about me. And, and God's like, that's the opposite of every single thing I've taught you ever. You're like, I, I know, but I'm special. So, so here we are. This is true for us because all of these things that I've just mentioned 
we go through these stages. And it's less about time, although it does take time. It's more, though, about what you have learned and experienced about God. It's not so much how much Bible can you quote, although that's a good thing. It's not, it's not, it's not so much about that. It's not so much about how many hours have you logged in using your spiritual gifts, which of course is good, but it's not always about that. It's about what have you experienced Jesus do in your life? Where have you seen him act? What things have you seen him do in your life and build into your life and into your character and into your soul? The Holy Spirit, the part of Jesus that is with us right now in this room, in your life, is constantly changing us to become more and more like Jesus and revealing the truth of who Jesus is to us. That's all in the scripture. So that means that we are constantly to be transformed all the time. So we're always going through these stages as well. So what are the stages? Just again, by recap, so far we've seen pre-awareness. This is where you're aware that something is missing in your life. And you, you might feel stuck or you might just feel like, ah, something's not quite there. It's not quite the same. Uh, the next stage would be awareness where like you finally see the reality of your situation and you can't unsee it. You can't argue with yourself and deny it anymore. Although denial is a big piece of missing this stage. And if we start to utilize denial, we will blind ourselves. And we could become like the Pharisees in scripture who knew a lot about God, but they were blind to the fact that God was standing right in front of them. Um, then the third stage is the turning point. This is where you, can, you decide, I can no longer stay in between where I am and where I, where I believe I need to be. So I'm going toward this next phase. And then that next phase is called the roundabout way. And that is where we learn to live freely in the presence of God. All of this, uh, if, 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 today, if you're here today and you weren't here last week, Everything I just shared, I went more in depth last week, so you can, uh, you can catch, catch our podcast and you can get more detail on that. Um, but I want to give you a passage of scripture. It's important to understand this because oftentimes I think we get this idea that um, as soon as you accept Jesus into your life, boom, it's up and to the right for the rest of your life. Everything's going to go your way, and that's not the case. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't like you or love you. In fact, it means he loves you very much, but he's going to lead you on a roundabout way. It's not always going to be easy. And so, for example, in Exodus 13, 17 through 18, Pharaoh lets the people go, and, he, and, and, uh, and we're told in Scripture, God didn't lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though it was the shortest route to their promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness to the Red Sea. And that's why I picked that phrase, roundabout way. But it's interesting. God takes us on a roundabout way because he knows what we can handle. He knows how we are going to respond to any given battle. And what he does, he allows us to deal with the battles that we can handle. Think about that one for a minute. He allows you to face the battles you're facing First of all, because you can handle them. Second of all, because you need the lesson about God going through it. Thirdly, because it's not going to overtake you. So whatever battle you're facing in your life, in any area of your life right now, I want you to know that God has already tailor-made this situation for you. He's walking you through it and helping you go through it because he knows this isn't going to destroy you. One second. It's awkward for me when I like, need to take a drink of water and we're all making eye contact. Like, I don't know what to do. So I'll just draw attention to it. There we go. The temptation in this point is to turn away. So like when we're in the roundabout way and we start to feel that tension build up because we're now entering into some kind of battles, not necessarily a battle with like a huge opponent, but a battle with an opponent that we feel, there is a temptation to back off and return to slavery, just like Egypt faced, and just like they were going to feel. What God did is he made sure they weren't, they weren't under too much pressure. But you know the problem with human beings? I'm not sure if you've caught on to this yet. We're super good at overloading and overwhelming ourselves. Yes. Can anyone relate? Yes. Yeah, you all can. I know it. We do this. We're like, oh, I have a free time. How about I take three jobs and put it into this day? 
because I need more. I did the like COVID. I was like, I'm still the pastor of this church. Felt like I had nothing to do. All right, I'll go work at the ER. There's a lot going on down there. And I'll keep chaplaining too. That's fun. And also, a master sounds great. Let's just add to it. Let's just keep going. And I just kept adding. And I'm so glad I did. Eventually, I started subtracting. And then, and then that really helped. But we do this to ourselves. There is a temptation, though. There's a huge temptation when we, are in, when we start to get into the battles and things get difficult to turn back. And I just want to tell you, don't do that. Don't do it when God has you on the roundabout way. And when you face a battle, understand that God is letting you fight this battle. He's not forcing you. He's letting you. And you are going to be better through it. That doesn't mean it's not going to be easy. And so when we're in, when we're in this phase, this roundabout phase, parts of, our, parts of ourself come to light that haven't been surrendered to Jesus yet. And so we have to acknowledge these things. And you guys can just put those up. I don't want to re-go through these because this is recap, but I want to get to the, to the new stuff, which is right now. But these are some things that happen when you start to come face-to-face with parts of yourself that aren't surrendered to Jesus yet. This is just some things that you do with it, some practical things. Again, catch last week's message. It'll be more insightful for you. Now, I want to get you to the new stuff. Here's the next phase. We've already gone through the first four. Here's the next phase. This one is going to be your favorite phase. Testing. (laughs) There's this new phrase that's been developed in the last, I I think, 10 years or so, but it's become very prominent in the last five. Test anxiety. Has anyone ever heard of that? Amen. Yeah. And in my generation, we didn't have it. I I never heard it. Uh, Of course, you'd feel some angst from time to time. I remember in middle school, there was this certain English teacher who would wear all black. He had this amazing three-piece black suit, tie, everything, every time he took a test. He would wear all black, because it was like the kids were mourning, you know, and it was like death. And I just remember, it was, I never got that teacher, but I remember seeing him in the hallways, like, man, there's the Grim Reaper. He must have a quiz on, you know, conjunctions or something today, whatever that is. So, we don't like tests. And um, most of us don't like tests. And what happens in this phase is God gifts you with obstacles, obstacles for you to get tested on. Now, um, James in scripture tells us that God does not tempt us, but he does test us. And you need to know just briefly that there is a difference between those two things. Temptation, it's intended to pull you off course and hopefully get you into sin or at least sideline you from whatever mission God has for me, for you. That's temptation. God doesn't tempt you to do wrong. He doesn't tempt you to quit the mission. He doesn't tempt you to be someone other than him. That comes from the enemy or it comes from within us. But God does test us. And he tests us to see if he can trust us. God tests you because he wants to see how much he can trust you with. When you are being tested... It's, it is a gift. Testing is not intended to condemn you, but to clarify your faith, your virtue, and your character. So clarification just shows you what is there. It gives you a little picture of, okay, I'm struggling with this, with this virtue. I've got some, got some gaps in my character right here. I need to, I need to pay attention to this and, I'll, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work on me here and, and do some effort there. It helps me understand that, all right, my faith is struggling in this area or it's doing great in this area. It's clarifying. When you are clear, then you can move forward. It's hard, it's hard when you can't see. In fact, that's what, I don't remember his name, but the bad guy in the Karate Kid taught the Karate Kid wrongly, if a man can't see, he can't fight, even though he was setting him up for a disaster later. It is important, though, he's right. If you can't see, you can't fight. And God wants you to be clear on who you are so that you understand who he's making you become. And so Jesus endured tempting in the desert in Matthew 4. So did Moses, and now so is Israel. And first, their first big uh, test, sorry, their first big test was the Red Sea. In Exodus 14, 10 through 15, and then verse 31, we're going to put these verses up here. I'm going to give these to you. Um, And also, if you have your fire Bible with you, they're noted on there too, the page numbers, if you're looking for that. What's happening, <clears throat> what's happening is Israel is camped by the Red Sea. Egypt is approaching their entire army. And it, the scripture tells us when the people of Israel looked up, 
They panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, why did you bring us here to die? There are plenty of graves for us in Egypt. What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't you tell us, that, or didn't we tell you this would happen when we were still in Egypt? And then, they, and then they said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves with the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. This is, this is panic. This is rough. God has done miracles for them. They've seen all the 10 plagues, the 10 strikes, or the nine, and then they've seen the Passover. They, there's no denying that God is fighting for them. And then they get here and they lose it. They panic. And Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. What a word for today, is it not? What a word for all of us today. Stand still, trust God, let him fight, be calm. That should be tattooed on all of your chests right now, or your back, wherever you want to put it, somewhere. That's like a good message for us. Post it on, on your fridge. Do whatever you want to do. The point is, it's good. I think it's good. You jump to verse 31, after God parts the Red Sea, opens it up, gets them through, the olives, uh, gets the entire Israel nation all the way through. Egypt follows them in. They get swallowed. They, they all drown. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed on the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This test was not how strong are you, Israel. It was how still could you be. And sometimes our greatest strength is found in standing still in, our, in, our, in the trust of God that we have. A lot of times our instinct is to fight or flee. But sometimes what God is actually calling you to do is neither. He's calling you to stand still to trust that God is the one who has this handled. Let him fight. Watch him fight. And you just simply be calm and rest in the fact that God has this. You don't have to. Last week, if you were here, I was like, you take it and you go like that. It's not mine to deal with. Sometimes God is like, I've got this. And you're like, I want to hold on to it. And he's like, you can't handle this. They couldn't handle Egypt, so God handled it. It's important for us to understand which battles are God's and which battles are ours. Because a lot of you are trying to fight God's battles on your own power, and God's not telling you to do that. In fact, what he's telling you is stand still. Stop fighting. Stop running. I've got this. Just watch me. One of the first things I had to teach my dog was this command. Watch. She's supposed to look at my eye. This is a treat. Look at the treat. Look at me. And I think it's important that we also understand God wants you to see him work on your behalf. It's hard to do that when you're fighting. It's hard to do that when you're running the other direction. And so this is what God is doing. Testing, remember this. Testing is about trust. How much do you trust God? And how much can God trust you? So oftentimes when we struggle, maybe we struggle with our money we start to fight. We start to, we start to run with it. And God's like, I will help you. I have some simple commands and guidelines in scripture, tons of resources. I own it all. It's all mine. I would love to help you, but you, you're, not allow, you're not surrendering yourself. You're not following my pathways here. Sometimes it's opportunity. Opportunities come and we, we deal with it in our own flesh. We deal with it in our own mindset. We just take over. It could be relationships. We're not honoring God at all in our relationships. God, I'll trust you this far, but when it comes to whatever you teach about about sex or about um, anything else in relationships, I'm going to do my own thing, but I'm going to ask you to bless it on top of that, even though I'm going against your scripture. When it comes to friendship, same deal. I'm going to gossip a lot. I'm going to be untrustworthy, but I need you to send me great friends. (laughs) Comes to ministry. God, I need you to just keep ministering to me, but I don't, I don't, I shouldn't have to minister to anybody else. Why, Why would I give an hour of my month? That's, you need to give a lot more to me for me to, for me to do that. When these things come up, God is testing you to see how much he can trust you. And he's testing you because he wants to trust you with more. We have to get that. 
God wouldn't bother to test you to see if he could trust you if he didn't want to give you more in your life. Whatever that more is, whatever area of your life you're being tested. There's this parable of the talents that Jesus taught where three people were given, uh, given ta- this is a story, but people were given these talents of money, these chunks of cash, and then, and then the owner left and then came back. One of them, they don't, two of them had doubled it and one of them had done nothing. He buried it. And then what happens is the person who buried it, his was given to the person who did the most. And the idea is that God wants to continually trust us with more. And if he sees that we don't, we don't care about what God wants, he's not going to give us any more. When was the last time for you? You stood in this place of testing, just like Israel, where in your life you stood in between Egypt and the Red Sea. And you really felt all that pressure and tension of testing on your shoulders. Picture this. Let's, let's do something different. Let's, let's do something uh, a little bit different with the scripture for a minute. Imagine you are in this actual test right now. You're standing right there by the Red Sea. You can smell the salt water and it's, it's high tide. So it smells nicer. We don't got any low tide right now, but it's high tide. You can hear the waves. There's probably seagulls. They're everywhere, especially around the water. You're there. You can, you can hear the war cries of Egypt not far away. You can feel the rumbling of their, of their troops and their, their chariots as they're moving closer, pounding their way toward your annihilation. You can feel that tension in your body, that stress of like, there's nothing I can do. I don't have a weapon. I don't have anywhere to go. And so your body begins to tense up. Here's the thing I've learned about spiritual warfare, by the way. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in all of it. We also tend to screw up spiritual warfare quite a bit because the majority of the battle that takes place spiritually in your life is in your own body. So we like to think that it's all out here, and there is a lot going on out here. But your body is a major prophet, not a minor prophet. God designed your body to interwork with your spirit and soul. So a lot of times, you've got tension in your life because you're ignoring conflict. And you're ignoring that conflict, could be because it's spiritual or because it's relational or whatever, but you're ignoring some spiritual things going on in your life. Your body can tell because God designed it to. And so this tension, Israel, we know they were tense, they were panicked, Scripture tells us. And here they are. But there's also this voice in this moment that tells us, don't be afraid. This is the Spirit speaking to each and every one of us while we're going through these testing moments. Don't be afraid. Stand still. Watch the Lord rescue you today. The enemy you see today, you're not ever going to see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just be calm. When was the last time you were in that place? I think a lot of times because we are running or because we are fighting on our own, we are fighting a spiritual test in our flesh. And we're missing the ability to embrace what God has for us and what he wants us to see and experience. We need these tests in our life. They are necessary to galvanize our faith and to remind us he is really what we need in our life. God is what we need. We think it's more money. We think it's better friends, better opportunities. What it really is, is we need more of God. If we have more of God, if we can hear his, if we can hear his direction and experience his presence, we'll make it through all the other, other stuff just fine. But without these tests, we won't find stillness. Stillness is the final phase. Uh, turn to Exodus 14, 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm. You will see that the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Then in verse 31, I've already read this, but I'm going to read it again. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. And they put their faith in the Lord and in their servant Moses. 
they were able to be still, and they saw the benefits of being still. Now this final stage, which brings us to the end of this cycle of growth, is the ability to be still because we trust in the Spirit of God to guide us, to provide us for us, and to deliver us from evil to maturity, from darkness to light, from ignorant to experienced. Here's the thing I need you to hear, though, about this stage. It's, it's a step. So this whole stage is like level one. Then you're going to start it all over again, and you're going to have a whole new cycle of growth in your life. And then however long it takes you to get through all those stages of pre-awareness, awareness, turning point, roundabout way, testing, stillness, pre-awareness, awareness, you follow me? Your whole life is going to be like this. Just embrace it. Just go with it. You will enjoy the process so much more. This is not a one and done kind of a thing. This is a constant, constant. Now, God made space out how big these steps are. And that's great. The longer space in between testing, I'm fine with that. But it is what it is. So be aware of that. But sometimes we need to see God do these things before we fully understand just how powerfully for you he really is. I think, I think because I hear from a lot of people that we think God is for others and not for us. And really not for you. But I'm telling you, God is for you. It doesn't matter how new you are in Christ. It doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus at all. This is what God is doing in every human being's life. We know from a simple reading of Scripture that God is working so that every human being would know him, whether you know him or not. So God is, he wants everyone to know him. And this is one of the ways he's doing it. So God is very powerfully for you. He is not too good to be true. He, he just loves us that much and is willing to fight for us that much. So how do you respond when you are tested? Do you recognize the times that you're being tested? This is, this is a big one. Because sometimes we write off our testing times as stress, poor time management skills, circumstances, coincidence. This is why I keep reminding us to say, Lord, help me see. There have been so many times I've overloaded my schedule and not recognized it wasn't me, it was God testing me. There are so many times I thought, oh, this is a bunch of different stuff and it's all connected and God is allowing me to be tested. There are so many times we need God to help us see. This is great for Israel, but what about for today, right? Again, I hope I've made it clear that this does apply to you now. But I want to I just wrap it up in Dylan or Jared or whoever, if you want to come up and give us a slow jam, that'd be great. Jesus provided the exodus from a life of sin and slavery to sin and death to one driven by his spirit and to fruitfulness and faithfulness and freedom by his death on the cross. And then by his resurrection, he empowered the whole thing to go to every, every single human being ever born in all of existence. This is where it continues to apply to us. Jesus came down to lead the final exodus. This was the first step, the first stage in God's plan to redeem humanity. Jesus' was the second one for everybody. And so I don't know where you're at in this room. Maybe some of you, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to pray with all of you, but before we do that, I want to put an invitation out. Some of you, maybe you've never, you've never known that or you've never taken the opportunity to trust your life and your soul to Jesus. Maybe you didn't realize that about 2,000 years ago, he was the son of God and he literally came from heaven to earth, was born in a human body, lived this perfect, incredible life, taught amazing things, but did amazing things. And then he died on, the cro on a cross as a final sacrifice for every sin that every human has ever committed. He gave himself freely to do that so that we could be seen as right in God's eyes. He was, he was murdered for our sins and our wrongs. He was put into a grave. And then three days later, he rose again. And he's still alive today. He shared his spirit with us. And so he did that and gives it freely because he wants every human being to know who they are in him. So if you've never made that decision to trust your life to Jesus today, I want to offer you the chance to do that. So first, will you bow your heads and close your eyes just so that we can make this 
a private moment. That's the only reason we do it. There's, no, I don't think there's, I mean, it's, it's a respect thing too, but in reality, it's just about making this private and anonymous. But if you're here today and you've never made that decision, but you want to, would you just do me a favor and raise your hand? Just say, I, I want Jesus in my life. I want to make that decision to trust my life to Jesus. I haven't done it before, or I did it a long time ago, and I just haven't followed through, but I want to start again today. That's you. Slip your hand up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. There's a couple hands that are up. That's amazing. Okay, you can put them down. There's a few of you. Great. And if you didn't, just sneak it in right now. We're all going to pray a prayer, and I'd appreciate if everyone in this room could do it so that we could stand with everyone else in this room who has done this. Just repeat these words. They're very simple. This is the first step in following Jesus, and I'll, I'd love to give you the rest later. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for giving your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Help me to know you and follow you every day of my life. Amen. Jesus, I want to pray for the people in this room who lifted their hands and they prayed that prayer for the first time in faith today. Thank you for being with them and encouraging them to cross that line of faith. Thank you for the new life that they have now. Thank you that their old is gone and the new has come, that you see them as new people from this moment on. Thank you for that. May their life be marked by knowing you from this point on. And God, I want to pray for those in the room today who are enduring testing and who are trying to find stillness. God, I pray that you would give them hope from what they've heard today, that the, the information they've been given would be empowering. But God, I pray that you would give them tenacity in their faith, that they would be able to endure, to outlast, and to grow more trustworthy to you from the testing they're enduring. Jesus, I ask you to bless them. Help us find stillness in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before you go, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you just fill out the little card that's in the back of your seat and drop it by our, our connection center on your way out and just put, just put pray at the bottom, I, I'll get it and I, I want to give you the next steps of what it takes to follow Jesus and just, I, I just want to have a conversation with you. So please, please do that for me. I would really appreciate it. Uh, everyone else, and everyone in the room, those two, um, will you join us downstairs? We've got a whole great party planned for you guys downstairs. There's hot dogs, there's popcorn bar, there's all kinds of activities. So you're all dismissed. Please go downstairs. Have a great time. Bring your coats. It's really cold because the door was open. That's it. Okay, God bless.